Namaste and welcome to You TV Show. In today's episode of U.S. Asia Futuristic Talk Series, we have with us Dr. D. Aker, the director of Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at University of San Diego, California, USA. The topic for today's think tank discussion is defying extremisms, a different path. In November last year, we held our first defying extremisms conference. We brought um, 125 uh, leaders or survivors or people who've seen the light, so to speak, and changed to a course in their own lives together to talk about what's happening. And they're not people who usually come together because we also had a lot of government officials who usually just send out or look first to the military response. So one of the findings, of course, was that extreme violence was hidden under and associated itself with every major religion in history, tarnishing each one with movements that have espoused violence and hatred rather than uh, tolerance and peace. So after that discussion, it became apparent that we really started to ha needed to have regional meetings. So one of the things that we did was have our first meeting, regional meeting in Asia, because there was great interest and support and hope for Asia. One of the peacemakers from the Philippines uh, Marianne Arnado, she had come to talk to, in, to inspire people to work with uh, some of the military actually because she works in her own country with military and, with, uh, and, and also with combatants. We were working with the Maoists in those days a little bit. And uh, so we brought some of the very women we brought back together for this. Probably in the United States people are more aware and more reactive to Islam as, as in concern. The reality is that Marianne, the person I just talked about, when she was working on the ground, there were originally not only um, Maoists in the Mindanao in the south where she was living and working, but also extreme Christian religious leaders who were organizing groups to go out and kill uh, Muslims. And one of the things that we did both at our conference and uh, back in November and in February in Mindanao is we brought together a chap who's the mayor of a town now, but he was a known terrorist, a Christian terrorist. We brought together former jihadists, uh, and we back in November and in uh, in Mindanao, we brought together some of the Islamic people from the um, Moral Islamic Front who are now active on the ground, or people they've been with have been active on the ground. But they're stepping back and they're seeing that this violence is not solving it, not bringing about what they intended. Extremist movements seek to gain power through instilling fear and utilizing the power of religion. Religions are very powerful, it's very handy. If you can say that you're speaking for religion, whether you are or not, whether you have any of the actual information or faith or intention of the religion. Um, the latest attacks by ISIS and Boko Haram are particularly alarming and it's been receiving more and more media attention. But there is disagreement on whether they constitute a d any degree of extremism in reality this is associated with religion, but simply this frustration. We need to pay attention to what is the ground that they're coming out of. Women are not immune, of course, to being to participating. There are uh, suicide, women suicide bombers. There are women who get engaged in this process. A gendered human security, non-state-centric approach is pretty much untried, but where it is, it's working, and we need to be engaged in it. And the word secular needs to be demo um, demystified or demythologized, because being secular, having secular options for the majority of people where they can still practice their own religion is the ideal. And it's not either or, it's both. Um, and in order to undermine violent extremism, we have to have strong state institutions. There has to be rule of law. There have to be legal mechanisms. There have to be uh, ways to combat corruption impunity, provide equal rights to minorities. It has to be there because if we don't have it, if that's not there, it's just too easy for people to build and take away and uh, cause the problems that we're seeing in, in this temptation. It's really evident from the current rapid growth of extremist movements that the current military and security based approaches to responding to it don't, doesn't work. I mean, it's not making the change. I mean, it's only increasing. I mean, look at uh, Nigeria, look at various uh, somewhere places. I think it's a very high time to tackle this issue. It's better to prevent this problem at the beginning than struggling, fighting against this problem. ISIS have hijacked our beautiful religion. 
you know, and they have misinterpreted it, and they have been, you know, no religion on the face of world calls for selling women or beheading heads or doing what's going on. Since the Iran and Iraq war, I was 10 years old when it happened. We have seen the blood, we have seen the bombing, and this has become a part of our lives. The youth of Libya are two groups, either killers or being killed. So this power of the gun and money itself, I think, is very attractive for the, the young uh, minds. We have extremists offering them an alternative and even giving them another model, role model. You are a fighter, you are a man. The Islamists made a big mistake. When they arrived, they used force, they used terror to make people join their ranks. I think you need to hit rock bottom to actually push and push and push for change that is sustainable, that is, that is grassroots based, as opposed to let us as countries and let us as governments think about what the solutions could be. These are real people, real experiences and thinking about what could make a difference for them. Now, there's a very serious initiative that is seeking to unite all the democratic and national forces and builds a partnership among all of them. And secondly, is the empowerment of civil society organizations. Once like we get these boys uh, in Paman Center for Conflict Transformation and Peacebuilding in Islamabad, we help them in understanding their own self, uh, they, they being not only uh, the Muslims and Pashtuns, but also human beings, and how they can actually contribute positively. What we work on is how to have social cohesion between those two communities, and especially youth, through arts. We need to educate the youth since, you know, from the very beginning, from the primary education, they need to be uh, educated about, uh, about the law, about the rights, about human rights, about what does it mean to be a civilian, what, is your, what are your civic duties and your responsibilities and your rights. We're done with the question, the healing must begin. Women are coming here with the plural eye and also struggling with peace, also struggling for rights, and also trying to tell the world we have solutions because th their solutions are working. At the end of the day, regardless of what religion or country we come from, we are all humans, we all believe in human values. I'm proud to be a woman, for sure. I'm lucky to be a woman. Uh, I'm proud also to be a Muslim and a Libyan and a humanist. The experiences I got in the field of civil work and seeing all this um, social injustice that's happening, it got me thinking that I can never uh, be on the bench and not do something about it, and that's what keeps me going. Somebody from that society, from that community, has to stand up to this challenge, and that's my power. Despite all this, they will not be able to divide us. I will still hold my hand out in peace and in cooperation to my neighbor who is Sunni, who is Christian, who is Baha'i, all the minorities in Iraq, in order for us to live in harmony and peace. We have a lot of unemployed young men and women, um, and nobody's working to solve that, investing in it, investing in getting jobs for these people, or finding a way to make the community inclusive or support them while they're you know, transitioning, if it's a transition issue. Um, it's not going to work because it's very easy right now with social media the jihadists are raising billions billions of dollars right now one of the people who came to our conference in November uh, is a former jihadist uh, now working for the Canadian government um, and he said and he's a specialist in social media and he looks online he follows the, the, the counter back and forth and just watches all these young men being drawn into this process um, and he said you know there's no way for me to get the funding to begin to tell the story or to get the media out there in the same way as, as these jihadists can do it because they're really taking advantage of that. So there has to be also an international human rights system and just structural transformation in terms of strong legal systems. It's really important. We know the violence is the outcome of the anger of misguided youth. So when, when the anger is misguided, and like you rightly said, when they don't ha see that there's uh, there's no opportunity, they don't see the you know 
their uh, future, then they fall into the trap. Don't you think that to address the problem in a long-term perspective, there are, let's say, we, we have a different approach to education. People are more focused in the, not in the developing the personality and wholesome, you know, uh, our education doesn't these days necessarily concentrate on building a useful, a peaceful youth. So there could be components, for example, like arts, arts and culture, probably meditation, you know, to make a person peaceful. And once a person, a youth, is peaceful, the way they react to the injustice, a perceived injustice, would be different. It's true. I mean, finding that, that centered self or that peaceful self, one of the things we've discovered in our women peacemakers that we bring in from all sorts of countries in conflict, and they've stayed on the ground, they've been their way of bringing people back, whether it's former child soldiers, whether it's whatever, all of them are using the arts, every one. And our peace, we're going next to Bosnia with another regional meeting where we're bringing people together there on this issue. And our peacemaker from Bosnia, that's, that was the entire summer work, I mean, to deal with what had happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Kosovo and the, the lasting bitterness was to use the arts. But arts are absolutely important. And it's interesting, for a while in the United States, only recently we started having them in schools again, we actually cut things out like that. So we didn't have the money for it. It's a funding issue again. What are our priorities on, on issues like this? 2008, Nepal declared as a secular state. So after that, you know, we have seen a lot of other religions coming on Nepal, advocating their own supremacies, especially the Christianities and Islamist things are going on. Uh, do you think that the Nepal could plug into another kind of extremism in futures? Yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent question. And I'm not here enough of the time to, uh, to really know that. But I think that the issue isn't whether Islam is, you know, is an increasing number of Islam. It's, it's the issue of the kind of Islam, whether it's true Islam. It was interesting that one of our peacemakers from um, Bangladesh, they were having a real hard time with the increasing uh, violence, and especially against women and the teachings. And what they discovered was that the imams there were, that she was dealing with were pretty um, uneducated. They actually could not read the Quran. They could not read at all. So her solution was not to tell them they were wrong. She actually went out and they started teaching imams how to read. And it made a huge difference because it's not the religion. It's, it's the abuse of that religion. It's people who are looking for power. If they're looking to come to Nepal and get power over people, then I'd pay attention. It's not going to just be Islamic people. It's going to be a lot of different people take advantage. The Conversion in Nepal uh, with Christian missionaries has been happening since last uh, 30 years. So once the country went secular, uh, a lot of countries in the West, they've been very vocal about it and uh, the funds have gone high and uh, the number of visitors have, have been also increased. And during the Madhes Andolan too, uh, there were huge funding from the Gulf, or from the Arab, into Tarai for establishing madrasas. So the number went from 4,000 madrasas all over uh, uh, Tarai to 14,000 to 15,000 just in one year. Um, now, if it's very interesting to look at how the Indian government has, uh, has its own connection to Nepal, because that was the time when uh, the Indian Congress were in power and the BJP was in a struggle. So it was a very new condition for Nepal, uh, especially after a civil war was over. The Maoists were adamant in getting all the power to themselves or wanting to bring the change that they had promised to the people. Now in 2013, when uh, the BJP is in absolute power in India, and with Modi almost citing Nepal in every speech, so it will be very interesting to see uh, how the pro-Hindu groups in India are going to study Nepal, get the right advices or the wrong advices, and build up strategies which kind of goes more in a, as Sir said, more in a very mature, peaceful way. And as Dr. D mentioned, that do we take an extreme measure or do we follow the path of tolerance and peace? And uh, find out a way where every religion gets its space. Uh, because obviously, uh, Nepal is a tolerant country. Uh, we have allowed a, a conversion. We have not uh, dejected or rejected people who have converted. In every village is now, there are converts, whether into Christianity or into Islam, uh, from the Hindus because of uh, 
uh, certain classes being barred from going into temples despite that they were born a Hindu. So it's, it's a yeah. very interesting time. Nobody has an answer to that yet. But it's, it's going to be very interesting to see that uh, the people in India who support or the people who run the pro-Hindu groups uh, get, get, getting, uh, having the tie-ups in Nepal, what kind of people they associated, what, what kind of schooling they have gone through, what kind of fundings they are looking at. And I re really liked what Dr. D said is, is the connection of extremism to politics and economy. Now that is something very new for me also. So how that's going to connect, like if, if the business leaders in Nepal are going to take a look at that in terms of connecting into Indian business hubs and making money legally or illegally, but taking religion, extremism as a base to that, or some groups in Nepal thinking that, that this is their opportunity to get back into power. The good thing is so far, the people of Nepal have shown a very uh, tolerant, peaceful approach to it. I'm so happy with this video because this is where it begins. Small pockets of leaders that dare to take risk and get a momentum and get a new majority. Because what I'm afraid of is a new majority of the bad guys. The new majority of the bad guys I'm really scared of because they have the social media, they have massive fundraising. They appeal. It's sexy. It's masculinity. It, it is all that we are not. We are boring. Even as the UN, we're boring. There's little excitement. So where is that exciting leadership that takes risks going to come from that will become the new majority? Where did we, as an intellect population that we are, where did we go wrong? Like, recently we just saw the attack in Sydney, right? Uh, I think it was one of the first kind of it's in Australia to ever happen. And it was attached to a jihadist group. But whereas it was not, the person was actually he was mentally unstable. And then, uh, then again, a hashtag came up saying, I'll ride with you. It was a very famous hashtag that actually brought up a lot of citizens itself in Australia to actually not believe that it's associated with religion. And is it because we people like us, people like us, intelligent population, that we retaliated with so much force that we went wrong, the groups like the ISIS, the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, that uh, even Boko Haram, that they just came out to even a greater extent. So do we have just turned a blind eye to them so that they just come up and settle down like that? Did we, as human intellect population, did we actually bring up the issues to such an extreme height? No, I don't think it's a matter of going wrong. I think it's a matter of isolation. And um, it's just too easy, in spite of all the television, of all things, to close down, to shut out what, what's going on. Um, as I said, the issue for young people, the reason they get tempted to these things, we, one of the people we had in November was the mother of the Bristol bomber. She had no idea. Her son was capable of anything like that. She's a good woman. She's, she's, and she could be devastated, but she's interesting. And this is what I think we have to spark in other people. She's now going out and working with other mothers around the world and telling them what to look for, what to sense, and, how they, and the way they have to respond to these kids. Because young people always look around the world for something exciting. It's either boring, or they're poor, or there are no jobs, or they just don't have the right education to begin with. How can it be uh, possible to smell the potential violence and prevent it? I didn't know the full form of SLR. That was, I, I just explored right now, and uh, self-loading rifle. And few years ba uh, back, I was holding that. And uh, now, I, I bought it, and this is DSLR. <laughs> 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 so this is a kind of brokering piece, I think. And uh, I was transformed into a uh, kind of squad uh, member to a uh, media man. So let us smell the potential violence before it is too late. When there is a potential violence and the people who perceive it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, instead of trying to force out a peaceful solution or a humanitarian approach, they look at money. During the civil war in Nepal, there were certain budgets that were created uh, which benefited a small pocket group of people in Nepal with some foreign consultants. And I think it's a, it's a global thing. Uh, where, wherever there is a potential for vi violence, uh, there's always one pocket of people who pockets a lot of money without doing any work. 
they have to buy uh, useless mercenaries or, or dead bombs from one country and ship it to another. It's just a couple of meetings in big locations and that's it. And, uh, and, and, and no part in the world is free from that, unfortunately. They have the money, they have the will, they have the knowledge to act fast. And uh, so recently it's very interesting to see how the US and Iran deal on the nuclear disarmament or mm -hmm. nuclear deal, deal carries on. I and mean, there's a lot of uh, speculation in the US that Iran is going to play games and the same thing in Iran is that the US is going to back out of its commitments. But let's see, I think it's a, it's a huge breakthrough in, in, the, in the global politics or peace. And uh, so there are leaders, I'm, I'm sure the engineers behind that deal are not seen public yet. And they must be very strong-minded uh, uh, intellectuals who must have forced that through. So let's see if, uh, if a couple of Asian countries are going to have those brains act fast and, uh, and see how common people can benefit out of these uh, peaceful approaches rather than few people who does not actually belong to any country, any religion. For them, it's just money at the cost of somebody's blood, at the cost of somebody's violence, at the cost of a country's failure. And uh, unfortunately, like uh, the extremists are funded, these guys are always in business, if not this country or that country. How to keep away the new generation from the revenge, or violence, or hate, or retaliation, or attack, bias? Some of our colleagues at the University of San Diego, and many people right now, are looking at two concepts that are really important. One is resilience and the other is reconciliation in, in, from people who've been caught in, you know, or their parents have been caught or they're the first generation after conflict. How do we bring them back in instead of just to go figure out your own way? Because we have to find some way to reconcile. There is no fresh generation, unfortunately. There is no one who comes without parents, without friends, without associates, without a history, without a religion that's taught to them. And so that becomes a tremendously difficult time. What there is, is the capacity for us to reconcile, to actually um, feel a common resilience against what was negative in the past so that you have that peaceful sense so that we can actually work at it. Peace, peace is a lot harder than, you know, violence or war or anything else. It's a lot harder. It's a process and you have to work at it all the time. I really want to understand what extremism is from a women point of view. When I watched the video, India's daughter, what I found was the rapist said she should not have resisted the rape. The patriarchs, I mean. So are we going to categorize those patriarchs as extremists? Because before coming to a broader level discussion like this, we are facing day-to-day -day challenges, patriarchs everywhere, every step. So I think we are talking about a different path over here. When we talk about, about patriarchs, what different strategy do we have for men? I mean, because we're talking about power also. And power and patriarchy go together, goes together. So my question is very simple. Please make me understand what extremism is all about. When we listen to the government of India or the politicians, they, they talk about how much the, the common life is affected by the terrorists from Kashmir or even from Pakistan. But that is also a country where, from a woman perspective, they are mostly terrorized by their own relatives. Yeah, exactly. For them, Mujahideen and Al-Qaeda are not a bigger threat than their own father, husband, brother, parents-in-law, father-in-law, and uh, the daily life from the kitchen even to walking out to a grocery store. The brothers who want to protect them are the same guys who are creating the odd situation for their friends or relatives from other women from even walking on the street. Yeah. Extremism is those other things. Patriarchy, as it's been practiced for so long in so many situations, if we use the term, is extremist. I mean, it's not related to religion. It's a word that stands that means that it's costly the way we use it. I mean, that's not what, always what it means, but it's very costly to human beings. Um, so two parts to that. I mean, if, if for those of you who don't know, India's Daughter is in a new film that came out. I just met with the director about three weeks ago to talk about this. She's scared to death. I mean, you know, and they, they banned it in India the day it was supposed to come out, so that one of the television stations just went black. But the same night it was supposed to show there was the night I, I saw it in New York. And um, she talked about how difficult it was and how frightened she got 
and how extreme the situation became about around her. So she was using the term that way. She uh, called, just before she finished the film, she called her own home and she talked to her daughter who's uh, 13 years old and said, I'm coming home. I'm too frightened now. There are too many threats. I can't do this. And her daughter said, you have to stay there, Mommy, because if you don't, my whole future will be affected by the things that you're trying to talk about right mm -hmm. now. And so she'd stayed and finished you know, the film, and it's an amazing film, and it does show that. And it does show that kind of, again, this is, this is isolation that causes it. People can believe, men uh, or women can have certain beliefs if they're isolated from people who can t express another possibility. In the United States, there are a lot of men's groups now. I mean, we're even seeing on football players and people, you know, that, uh, talking about no more rape in the house. And they're actually kicking people off teams if they're doing it. If they're not, it's no longer easy. You don't get to get to do it because you're a boy. You know, that's not the possibility. I'll just uh, end the session with one last question to Dr. Inti because I didn't, I realized I didn't ask you any question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. America has a huge impact on the world. If we go back by decades, in 1980s, it was the news of the Gulf War that dominated the world during the senior George Bush. The 1990s, when Bill Clinton was in office, it shifted to poverty. Mm -hmm. We need to end poverty. Then again, during George Bush the junior, it was 9-11 happened. And during that time, the issue of terrorism surfaced for, for 10 years. Now, with Obama's second term, and it could be a big coincidence, it's, it's not even terrorism, it's extremism. And that's the topic we're discussing today. So every 10 years, <laughs> the US moves without solving a single one. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how do you look at extremism uh, from the US perspective and having its impact on the world and seeing if this is a problem that can be solved? So any leader can come up with great terminology for one thing and another. But the reality is us as individuals have to sit down and talk about what it means to us. Well, what is that extremism? That was an excellent question. Right? What does it really mean? And how do we really deal with that? So I can't speak for where the country's headed next. But I hope that we're headed as people, as human beings, as a global community, to actually listening better and you know, working better together. I believe this discussion was enlightening to you. We will be organizing U.S. Asia Futuristic Talk Series with new topics regularly. You can follow us at facebook.com slash Today's Youth Asia. Thank you for watching. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for staying. Thank you so much.